So, hello, and welcome to the final day of International Law Weekend 2020. Uh, it's morning here on the East Coast of the United States. And uh, when I was growing up in the 1970s, at about this time, uh, I'd be watching Super Friends cartoons. Um, and while I like to think of this morning's three panelists as sort of a new group of Super Friends, and we will be talking about things like artificial intelligence, battlefield robots, space weapon systems, and other things that sound like they're straight out of science fiction. Um, there's nothing cartoonish uh, about this topic. These are issues that relate to warfare and in many instances to the taking of human lives. From the longbow to nuclear weapons to today's autonomous systems, people have tried to regulate the use of emerging technologies in armed conflict. At times, those attempts at regulation have fallen short. As one of our panelists, Bill Boothby, has described an 1899 attempt to, quote, prohibit the use of projectiles, the sole object of which is the diffusion of asphyxiating or deleterious gases. That wording seemed to have a loophole, while projectiles that had the sole object of diffusing poison gas were banned. Projectiles that had multiple objectives, such as spreading shrapnel and dispersing gases, seemingly, by some interpretations, were not. Whereas we don't know whether the loophole actually contributed to the levels of use of poison gas in the First World War, it nonetheless provides a cautionary tale about the difficulty of controlling novel weaponry. The regulation of today's emerging technologies pose a particularly difficult set of challenges, some new, some old. Advances in AI, autonomy, space technology, hypersonic transportation, to give a few examples, all hold significant promise for commercial development as well as for military use. And I should note, much of the development of these technologies is being fostered by private companies. How do we regulate the military aspects without stifling the commercial and economic development aspects of these technologies? Should we be talking about regulating research and development or deployment or use or all of the above? And considering today's panel theme of uncertainty, how do we know that what is or is not being banned or developed, um, I should say, in government labs or corporate research programs around the world? That is, how do we know what is or is not being developed? As lawyers, how can we try to make regulation be at least as close as possible to the actual current issues in technology? We are very fortunate to have three speakers this morning uh, that have both great breadth and depth of knowledge in regards to these issues of law, technology, and conflict. After I briefly introduce the panelists, uh, they will each make their main remarks. After that, we will have a general discussion period and the, during the balance of our time, and you can submit questions via the chat function, um, and I will endeavor to weave as many of those into our conversation as possible. So to begin, let me introduce uh, our panelists for this morning. Our first speaker will be Dr. William Boothby. Uh, Dr. Boothby uh, has served for 30 years at the Royal Air Force Legal Branch, retiring in 2011 as Deputy Director of Legal Services in the rank of Air Commodore. He is an adjunct professor at La Trobe University in Melbourne and has taught at the Australian National University, the University of Southern Denmark, and the Geneva Center of Security Policy. Bill is a prolific author, and uh, with both single author, co-authored, and edited volumes um, concerning the law and armed conflict. His most recent book is New Technologies and the Law of War, uh, and the new, is, excuse me, is New Technologies and the Law in War and Peace. So I guess uh, it's uh, a book that he uh, edited and co-wrote. Uh, so you could, I guess you could say if he didn't write the book on the subject, he basically co-edited and, uh, and, and uh, co-wrote the book on the subject that we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, he's been a member of the group of experts that address direct participation in hostilities and produced the HPCR manual on the law of air and uh, missile warfare, the 2013 Talon manual on the law of cyber warfare, and the Loven manual on peace operations law. Among other degrees, Bill has a doctorate in international law at the, Euro at the Europa Universitat uh, from uh, Frankfurt. Our second speaker, Dr. Laura Grego, is the uh, research director 
uh, of the Global Security Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. She focuses her analysis and advocacy on the technology and security dimensions of ballistic missile defense and outer space security. She has authored or co-authored numerous papers on a range of topics, including cosmology, space security, missile defense, and missile defense. And she has testified before Congress and addressed the United Nations General Assembly and the UN Conference on Disarmament on Space Security Issues. Laura is a technical advisor for the Wimera Manual on the International Law of Military Space Operations. She's also served as an associate editor of Science and Global Security and as a delegate to the American Physical Society's Panel on Public Affairs for the Forum of, on Physics and Society. Before joining UCS, Laura was a postdoctoral researcher at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. She earned her PhD in experimental physics at the California Institute of Technology and a bachelor's in science in physics and astronomy at the University of Michigan. Our third speaker, Dr. Heather, Dr. Heather Harrison Dennis, is a senior lecturer at the International Law Center of the Swedish National Defense College. She is the author of Cyber War and, Laws of War and the Laws of War, which analyzes the status and use of computer network attacks in international law and examines their treatment under the laws of armed conflict. Heather's research and writing focuses on the impact of modern warfare of international on international humanitarian law, in particular on cyber warfare, advanced and autonomous weapon systems, and the legal aspect of enhancement uh, technologies on members of the armed forces. That last topic was um, the subject of a recent chapter that she'd written in that new technologies volume that I mentioned just a few moments ago. Uh, Heather has previously taught at the London School of Economics, uh, at the School of Oriental and African Studies for the University of London, and at Victoria University of Wellington. She was awarded her PhD from LSC in 2009, and is also a graduate of Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, and with a Master's of Law um, and a BA in Psychology. So with that, I turn things over to our first panelist, Bill Boothby. I just need to, uh, sorry, to unmute. Okay, Chris, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And uh, thank you to Eric and his colleagues for the uh, invitation to take part in uh, this uh, prestigious conference. It would not be right to say that we know nothing about weapon development plans. Reports do appear from time to time about new technologies and weapon systems. And what we know about future developments tends to be based on those reports, often in specialist online journals. But those reports are themselves limited to what those doing or perhaps benefiting from the research are content for us to know. That in turn raises worrying questions about what is going on behind the curtain. Is, for example, research into incapacitating chemical agents strictly in compliance with the Chemical Weapons Convention? Remember the CWC prohibitions of developing, producing, or acquiring chemical weapons, the treaty definition of chemical weapons to include any chemical which through its chemical action on life processes can cause, for instance, temporary incapacitation, and the very tight definition of riot control agents in that treaty. All lead you to wonder, is what's going on behind that curtain that I was talking about strictly in compliance? Discrete question. Is biological toxin research limited as required by the Biological Weapons Convention? Remember the BWC's prohibition of developing or producing biological agents or toxins and its obligation placed on states to take necessary measures to prohibit and prevent the development and production of these things. Do states enforce the rules by which they're bound? For instance, in relation to garage biology, meaning informal biological research by freelance individuals, which clearly is going on. And bear in mind that those two are fields where sophisticated international law already exists. What about cyber? 
The differences of perspective between the United States and its allies on the one hand, and certain Eastern states on the other hand, suggests that there is little prospect of early agreement of treaty law governing cyber. Indeed, we can't even agree on what to call the phenomenon, some calling it cyber, some calling it information and communication technologies. And the secretiveness that is associated with much state cyber activity would likely, in my view, preclude the emergence of detailed customary law on the subject. International discussions concerning autonomous weapons are taking place, as we know, under the umbrella of the Conventional Weapons Convention. They've been very useful, those discussions, but they're just that, they're discussions, and there is no legal provision yet. Then we think perhaps about hypersonic weapons, arguably existing international humanitarian law provisions cover them. Yet they do pose an awkward threat by drastically reducing the time in which decisions can be made on how to react, potentially by using the most destructive and strategically significant of weapons. That isn't the sort of decision, I suggest, that we would like to see taken in a rush. And yet, that is the very implication of that kind of technology. And where is artificial intelligence going to take us? A very, I suggest, open question at the moment. So let me offer some thoughts. The challenges posed by each kind of technology are different. So different solutions are needed. Not all solutions will, nor perhaps in, should they, involve the law in the strict sense. Garage biology requires police action to enforce domestic law offences, being offences which are actually prescribed by the Biological Weapons Convention. And in some states, perhaps, it requires the passing of those laws in accordance with treaty obligations. Cyber requires East-West discussion to resolve some fundamental differences of opinion, coupled, I suggest, with a Western application of existing international law to cyber. As to autonomous lethal weapons, patient pragmatic diplomacy needs to produce solutions that may be in treaty or perhaps in best practice guidance form. I suggest we don't need to be too prescriptive over the form that needs to be taken. It is what is going to, as it were, produce the required results that matters. Certainly what is required is a set of globally accepted norms. And maybe that is the approach that could also help with cyber and artificial intelligence. And finally, hypersonics. Speed is, I suggest, the common theme that arguably characterizes all of these technologies. It is a degree of speed that's going to prejudice, perhaps even defeat human decision-making. That raises an important question. Is machine-led warfare unacceptable? Or is it simply the inevitable consequence of scientific advance? If the answer to both of those questions is yes, will scientific progress trump our moral and ethical concerns? Or will there come a time when humanity is going to cry enough is enough? And will the law reflect that cry? Those are my comments. Thank you very much, Bill. Those are those are very thought-provoking comments, um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that many of the themes that you've brought up there, especially this, these questions on thinking about the relationship of scientific advancement and the role of law, um, will be things that we'll come back to again and again in this panel. Um, I'll turn things over now to to Laura for our second presentation. Hi, thank you so much, Chris, for the invitation to speak, and I'm so honored to be on the panel with these. Uh, brilliant minds, and I've already learned a lot. Um, I am not a lawyer, as, as you heard from my bio, so I'm coming at this from a different point of view. Um, 
I am going to use slides. There are a few graphs in there. So I'm doing, I want to make sure I'm doing my part for you to get your continuing education credits. Um, I, uh, let me pull the slides up. Thanks. Chris, can I get a verbal uh, check-in for me? Yes, great. Um, I was particularly taken by the phrase in the panel description um, that there's often disagreement concerning the relative promise and peril of the development, let alone the weaponization of various new technologies. Informing that debate in the policy realm is a significant part of my job. So I'm gonna spend my short time with you digging into that a little bit. Um, science, as you know, establishes boundaries within which technologies must work and engineers devise ways to execute projects within those scientific boundaries. Uh, technical people generally have a pretty good idea of where money or effort might lead to breakthroughs or where surprises might happen. So on the face of it, what is there to debate? Um, but, uh, but, I thought, but I thought what I'd talk about today is the process of a, of a social construction around technical facts. Um, bureaucratic and economic interests can grow around a technology. States may think they have to develop technologies that their competitors are developing, even if they don't have a clear mission for it. And actors develop rationales for projects that suit their policies or politics, sometimes post hoc. Uh, so I thought uh, I, it would, might be interesting or useful to illuminate how this has happened in a couple of example technologies that are um, considered today as emerging. Uh, areas for regulation and, and legal concern. I'm going to look at space weapons and at hypersonic missiles. Um, so uh, space, space is often described as the ultimate high, high ground and that generates all sorts of expectations based on the analogies with earth-based earth high ground. Strategic reasons for taking the high ground include that it provides a vantage point for seeing the enemy coming you can see much further from a hill, only one force can occupy the, the privileged position. It might allow you to conceal yourself from your enemy's view. The metaphor of space as a high ground can lead your intuition into all sorts of incorrect directions. And I would argue that it has led attention sometimes to being paid in the wrong places in terms of regulation and limits. The high ground suggests that space is privileged, both in being that space can keep you protected and that it is an ideal place from which to, to target Earth it's really actually almost the opposite of that. Um, so briefly, since I am the, your token scientist, um, I do want you to come away with this, that space is different in significant ways. Space is a place, but orbit is a condition, and we are talking about orbital objects. Um, but you'll see this yellow curve here is, is something that an intercontinental ballistic missile coming from North Korea to the United States. That's, that's where it would travel. And so it travels in the same, same part of space as a low Earth orbiting satellite does. Um, but to get into orbit, um, physics puts a lot of constraints on that. Objects in orbit um, are what we're talking about. A satellite has to stay in orbit by, um, by uh, governed by um, a very simple equation, which says you have to have a specific speed that, that depends on altitude. And that speed actually is very high, around 30 times faster than the speed of a jet. So it takes enormous energy not so much to get satellites up to an altitude, but to get them going fast enough to stay there. Um, this is a picture of an Atlas V rocket, and you can see it's very visible, very powerful. We're gonna come back to the, the visibility of that. But this, but this, um, the fact that it takes enormous energy has, has um, important consequences. Um, space launch is generally loud, invisible, and when you're looking at this picture, only a few percent of the mass of this launching rocket is actually the payload, actually the thing that has capability that's left in space. Almost all of it is, is an energy source and it's very expensive. Um, currently it's 15 to $20,000 per kilogram to put something in orbit. By the same token, um, satellites cannot hover over territory on the Earth. They will necessarily travel above territory of both ally and adversary. So this idea that you can pull your, your valuable assets into a bunker doesn't really apply here. That's an advantage, of course, because one observation satellite can then be used to, to monitor much of the Earth. Although, um, but if the goal is to target something on the Earth on a short time scale, for example, if you are trying to engage a launching missile or a time sensitive target, your satellite will not be in the right place most of the time because it's moving in orbit. You'll need a lot of them to have one at the ready. So this animation shows what it takes to cover this the little pink area, North Korea. 
for example, with missile defense interceptors, which is a time-sensitive type of technology. Um, launching missiles uh, are only in their active launching phase for around three to five minutes, so you'd need to get to it that quickly. Um, to, to target one, one or two of North Korean missiles um, to have something in place would require some 600 satellites in orbit and maybe $300 billion of investment. Um, by the same token, um, that's not the only difficulty with targeting Earth from space. Objects don't just drop like bombs. Once in orbit and moving at high speeds, it requires a lot of energy to slow a satellite down enough to get it out of orbit. And you have to carry that fuel with you. All of these considerations make space-based Earth-facing weapons generally quite expensive and generally very uncompetitive with other options, even for less time-sensitive targets. Um, for that reason, no one has really developed such weapons. Um, and also for this reason, space operations have been focused mainly on the transmission and receipt of electromagnetic signals. Um, you know, satellites observe Earth from space, they transmit communications across long distances, send navigation radio signals and GPS satellites, rather than the transport of mass up and down from, from Earth. No, we don't drop bombs. Um, we don't generally have space-based missile defenses and, and space tourism or troop hosting um, is, is something that is yet to take hold. Um, so while uh, space weapons generally um, are, generate the most concern, um, they are not the leading edge of technology. Another, oops, sorry. Another consequence um, of being in orbit is that satellites tra travel on predictable paths. Not only the satellite's owner, but any other observer can predict with good accuracy where a satellite will be at a future time. It's very difficult to hide in space. These, these are pictures of the OCNO, um, Russian OCNO ground-based optical observatories that are satellite observers. Um, observers can see what you're doing in space and adversaries could also use that information to target satellites. So it's, um, satellites are vulnerable in that way. Um, although the ability to um, observe space um, is unevenly held, it does take an investment of significant resources to build a system that can approach a comprehensive ability to monitor what's happening in space, to know what's happening, what's moving where uh, in close to real time. And I will note that it has become rapidly more difficult and complicated in the last few years because many hundreds of small cheap satellites have been launched as well as large commercial constellations such as Starlink. Um, that is almost double the number of satellites that, that need to be tracked. Um, however, looking at it the other way, it's quite difficult to assure oneself that your activity can remain undetected for long. It does not take a state actor to see what's going on in space. Um, for example, earlier this year, hobbyist satellite observers, so these are folks who set up their binoculars and telescopes in their backyards every night, reported unusual behavior in one of Russian satellites known as the Cosmos 2542. Um, launched in November of last year, Cosmos 2542 had been orbiting in the same plane as a US satellite operated by the National Reconnaissance Office, so likely a spy satellite. The Russian Cosmos 2542 satellite performed a series of maneuvers so that it became close to USA 245 all the time rather than occasionally. While the US government certainly knew this, has the capability to know what is happening, it wasn't the US government that first made this public. It was the hobbyist backyard satellite watchers who saw and publicized the Russian shenanigans on Twitter. Um, and that is illustrative of a few key ways um, that, that, that things are changing. First, uh, you can say that you should always assume what you're doing in space will have an audience unless you take great pains to disguise it. Uh, and that disguise will likely impact your mission. Um, and it will not just be observed by the major spacefaring states. This will not just be um, the handful who, who dominate space users. States cannot con count on controlling information. In fact, I don't think the United States would have necessarily openly talked about Russia's program, except that uh, it was brought public by, by the amateurs. And also, while Russia might have come back and argued that the US was making it all up, that it was simply propaganda, that they weren't doing anything, they really couldn't because there's a neutral third party who'd already seen it. While such observations might not hold up in a court of law or be used as a basis of a legal objection to an arms control agreement or to support a claim of negligence, um, they can be powerful in their own way, directing our attention in the right places. 
Um, so that is the high ground. Um, what I meant to take you is a quick tour through sort of some of the technical boundaries that would indicate that space is not really a protected clandestine perch from which to target others. It is really uh, better thought as a relatively vulnerable and expensive perch. A second, uh, oops, a second socialized technical fact around space that's really not a fact at all is the suggestion that any satellite can be a weapon and therefore it's impossible to regulate space weapons. And we, we've heard this many times as objections to um, proposed treaties and regulation of, of space weapons. I hope most of what I've said can help you see why this is simply not true. While many satellites have enough fuel to deorbit and come back to Earth and are designed to do so at the end of their operational lives, they will deorbit slowly and with limited accuracy. Um, they will mostly burn up in the effort to get through the atmosphere and they're not designed to withstand the heat and pressure of those conditions. They are not useful ground targeting weapons that, that you can turn your old satellite into, into something powerful. The other idea that, that the other reason people say uh, satellites, all satellites could be weapons, um, is that most satellites have some ability to maneuver in orbit and they can be used to tar thus can be used to target other satellites. In fact, um, satellites move slowly with limited ability to maneuver. The ability to get up close to another satellite is a sophisticated um, and specialized technology. Most satellites have absolutely no ability to do that. Um, so I would argue that um, many of the objections and promotions around space technologies um, uh, could be done away with um, by looking carefully at the technology and that might help to illuminate uh, possible place, places to fruitfully look at, at regulating the most dangerous aspects of these technologies. So I wanted to quickly turn to hypersonic missiles um, because they have similar characteristics. Um, while they're a hot topic, a lot of the conversation, I think, is what my colleagues call hypersonic hype. Um, hypersonic missiles are airborne vehicles traveling long distances through the atmosphere at more than five times the speed of sound. So um, the, the, the technology that's, that's furthest along and the most likely is something called a boost glide vehicle. And so you see the image on the bottom. What happens is a, is a powerful missile, something almost exactly like an ICBM, will launch uh, a craft up and will quickly dip back down into the atmosphere and travel most of the way through the atmosphere towards its target using aerodynamic lift and to keep it aloft and drag forces to maneuver um, until it gets where it's going. The dominant narrative around this technology is that these are game changers, unmatched speed, greater reach than ballistic missiles. Um, uh, you might be convinced that such missiles um, are revolutionary or necessary for strategic competition. Um, a look at the physics of how they work indicates that the hype comes from this, some misunderstandings of this technology. To be sure, hypersonic missiles are fast. Um, the working definition of hypersonic is five times the speed of sound, uh, but they are not uniquely fast or newly fast. Um, even the first modern missile, the German B-2, achieved near hypersonic speeds in the 1940s. Intercontinental range ballistic missiles, which the US and Russia have fielded since the 1960s, travel much faster than that, more than 20 times the speed of sound. This technology is also not new. Um, the United States, for example, has been developing them since 1950. Um, and despite some research and development successes in those days, um, the performance disadvantages compared to other options led them to be mainly set aside. Uh, ballistic missiles were more versatile and there was not a real objective for these hypersonic technologies. In the post 9-11 timeframe, there was renewed interest based on the discussion in the US about wanting a long range missile that could target time sensitive targets or non-state actors, but which could be distinguished from, I, from ballistic missiles, which were closely associated with nuclear weapons. Um, uh, later, as um, Russia and China started investing more in these technologies, partially in a response to the US decision to exit the anti-ballistic missile treaty and build missile defenses, um, the U.S. got more interested again um, so that it would not fall behind in a cutting edge technology arms race. So recognizing that many of the claims about hypersonic missiles um, were qualitative rather than quantitative, um, my colleague at my organization is producing an open source modeling uh, that looks into some of these claims. This is not my work, but I can show you sort of the, the basics. Uh, for example, speed are hypersonic missiles faster than existing ballistic missiles. In fact, um, 
uh, because the drag on hypersonic missiles slows them down in the atmosphere, their average speed is lower than a ballistic missile, but ballistic missiles go high before they go far, so they, they have a longer sort of uh, a longer journey to make. So uh, compared to normal way you use a ballistic missile, hypersonic, um, hypersonic missiles get there a little bit sooner. Um, but if you optimize your ballistic missiles to get somewhere quickly rather than um, optimize another sort of characteristic, you'll see that you can get there uh, more quickly with the ballistic missile. At intercontinental ranges, the differences are a few minutes, maybe up to five minutes. So not revolutionary um, really uh, at all. The other claim is that these missiles will be nearly invisible in flight and arrive without any warning. Um, in fact, that is not true either. I think this assumption comes because of most of the sensor capability that has been deployed are optimized for ICBMs and their radars that have been built over the decades for those. The low flying maneuvering missiles would literally fly under the radar. Um, so while it's true that radar systems are ill-suited to providing advance warning of these missiles, technologically advanced countries such as the US and Russia don't rely on radar systems for early warning solely anymore. They feel satellite-based sensors to watch for the infrared light emitted by the launching missiles, like the picture I showed you earlier. These satellites will see- Laura, if, if uh, you could wrap up in, in just a, a minute or so. And, yes. Uh, and then we'll, and we'll come back around to these as well. But. I'm sorry, I wasn't seeing you. Yes, uh, I am basically done. Yes, uh, you'll see that um, you can see them. You can see the, the, um, the, the launch of them and you can see their trajectory as they move through the atmosphere with um, high temperatures. So, um, so essentially what this says is that um, ballistic, that uh, hypersonic missiles are not faster, they are not invisible, uh, and they don't, um, they are evolutionary rather than revolutionary. Okay, thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much for, sure. you know, for explaining the science to, to a group of lawyers um, and, and providing, I think, you know, as you said, sort of, um, you know, a dose of, of sort of reality to sometimes when we hear a certain amount of hype about different types of systems um, that, you know, leads to a lot of discussion, which might not be actually accurate in terms of the issues that we should actually be talking about. So, um, so thank you for that. And, and we're, we'll come back around. And I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot about both space-based weapons and uh, hypersonics uh, in the next few minutes. Um, for our uh, third main speaker, uh, we'll turn things over to Heather. Well, hi, and thank you, Chris, and also thank you to the American branch of the International Law Association, the organizers of, of the International Law Weekend, uh, for the possibility of taking part. I was saying earlier to, to the panel that one of the few plus sides of our current difficult times that we're living through is that we get to, to be together um, when otherwise we might not be able to be. Um, I want to pick up on something that both um, both Bill and Laura said, on, on and Chris just made in that final point, um, about where we look for what's coming. Um, and, and the point I want to emphasize is we look to the science. It can't be said enough, I think. Um, we read. Now, whether that's scientific journal articles, technology news reports, academic science blogs, and we follow the leads and we talk to the scientists. And we talk to them from all credible perspectives. And we ask the questions, is this possible? Is this feasible? Or is this the magic of Hollywood or a hypersonic hype? Um, so I, I think it may, you know, it, it's, it's important to, to come around and say, we need this dose of reality that, that is bought by, uh, by the science. And now it may well be that particular scientists can't tell you what they're working on. Either they've signed non-disclosure agreements or what they're working on is classified. And, but they can give you a reality check. And if you ask the right questions, they can talk about research in the public domain that allows us an insight. It is absolutely true. And it is of course the entire point of this panel that we may not know exactly where the cutting edge is. But I would argue perhaps a little controversially um, that in some senses, it doesn't necessarily matter. Weapons development and review procedures by states have always been classified. This is not new. This is the case where the reviews are conducted under Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions or for states like the United States that are not party to that protocol 
as a matter of policy grounded in older law. States don't give away their military advantage that they are spending a lot of time and energy and money developing, and they're not legally obliged to. And as there is no international monitoring body that can investigate compliance with applicable laws, we are left with looking at scientific developments, trends and activities, and drawing logical conclusions from them, just as Laura indicated with regards to space. With, I would add, a big healthy dose of scientifically based imagination. There are a couple of quotes from Albert Einstein, obviously a scientist who was at the cutting edge of his own time, that I think are particularly relevant here. So the first quote is that logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. And the second quote is that imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attractions. Now, I would argue that it is also the preview of war's coming attractions. Because most technologies that we're discussing here have both military and civilian applications, the science is usually out there in the civilian realm. In fact, most of the developments in the field of artificial intelligence are taking place in the commercial sector. But we can also look at proof of, proof of concept experiments. So for example, in 2007, three years before Stuxnet was discovered in the Iranian Nantan's uranium enrichment facility, a video was released showing physical destruction of equipment via a cyber operation. The proof of concept was produced by Idaho National Laboratory for the US Department of Homeland Security. Now those two events may not necessarily be directly related but it shows a capability that exists. We can also look to funding calls and applications, for example, DARPA, although it doesn't tell you, of course, at that point, whether the science is successful or not, but it is a clue that can be followed. And a funding call tells you where the interest lies. On the subject of DARPA, the Cyber Grand Challenge um, in 2016 also provided insights into cutting edge technologies of interest to the military. It demonstrated not only the speed of AI-enabled cyber tools, but also that potential ability of a singular algorithm to play both offense and defense simultaneously. We can also look to what civilians are doing. Again, if we look at the cyber realm, we can look to hackers' presentations at either DEF CON or Black Hat conferences, what's happening in the more technology-oriented parts of social media, or we can look to attacks carried out by criminal groups, whether they're state-linked or otherwise. In terms of human enhancement, modafinil isn't only the go-to cognitive enhancement for the military, but also for a certain strata of university students looking for a competitive edge. Of course, sometimes we get access to a lot more, either as the result of whistleblowers or other leaks, which no matter where you stand on the issue of the leak itself, provides outside observers with a valuable insight into the capabilities of a particular of the particular actor involved. So when parts of the NSA cyber arsenal were leaked online in 2016 by the Shadow Brokers Group, we, we saw an insight into what the capabilities of, of the US government were. We can also look to indictments pursued by governments such as the United States, which expose some of the capabilities of other states. Bearing in mind, of course, that what they're prepared to expose that they know will be scratching the surface at what they actually know. But all of these examples show that it just takes a little imagination, a little bit of connect the dots and a bit of strategic thinking to see how that might be applied by a modern armed force. And we use that as a basis for our response in regard to, reg to regulation. So on the subject of regulation then, as Bill noted, Different technologies require different approaches to regulation. Yes, the technologies themselves bring different challenges, but I think we can also break it down in a slightly different way. I would say either it's because they're affected by different bodies of law, affecting different actors, they're at different stages of development, or perhaps because we have more meta level questions to discuss. I want to take each of those in turn. So the first is that the technologies might be affected by different bodies of law and affect different actors. And here, for example, we can compare, for example, cyber operations on the one hand and human enhancement technologies on the other. 
And here I'm talking human enhancement technology uh, as used by the military rather than, rather than the garage biology that Bill referenced. If we take cyber operations to begin with, cyber operations can clearly be weaponized against an enemy. They are governed by IHL, that's international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict. Whether that is by the application of specific rules of IHL to cyber operations, such as those being applied by Western states, or by adherence to the general principles of IHL, which we should probably remind ourselves that both Russia and China have agreed to in previous GGEs. There are also specific review processes provided for in the law. I mentioned earlier Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1, but also the fact that non-Additional Protocol 1 states have review processes as a matter of policy. Although it has to be said that compliance is not that high. And for those cyber operations which take place outside the bounds of an armed conflict, obviously uppermost in people's minds at this point is probably electoral interference, um, regulation through multilateral efforts, such as the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, that's a, a product of the Council of Europe, but is um, open to all states, um, which provides a framework for mutual assistance and guidance for states implementing their national measures. There's also work on confidence building measures between states. If one compares that fairly structured body of law coming out of IHL and out of, um, out of other multilateral treaties, we can compare that with human enhancement technologies used by the military, which is more inward focused. Here we're primarily dealing with our own forces, although it can conceivably be applied against an opponent. Um, it would be in circumstances where human rights law is still the predominant framework, for example, in detention situations. You're not gonna gas an entire battlefield. It might be more likely that you would um, seek to apply, for example, oxytocin to, to a cell to make a person who is being detained more cooperative and want to talk to interrogators. Completely illegal, by the way, let me put that right out there now. Um, but, but it's also, uh, also governed by human rights law in that particular instance. The, the prevailing regulatory framework in that, uh, in that instance is of human rights and of medical ethics. So firstly, from the perspective of the human rights of soldiers who are the subject of those technologies and the question of what rights may be legitimately impacted by technologies designed with the idea of sort of conserving the fighting force. For example, there'd be ideas around bodily integrity, the right to refuse enhancements, the right to freely, uh, freely receive information when it comes to the case of brain machine interfaces, particularly those that mediate information between the machine and, and the subject. Rights to privacy. Secondly, but no less importantly, the human rights of those who come into contact with those enhanced soldiers. I mentioned also medical ethics. And there we look to questions around the use of cutting edge technologies on members of the armed forces before they are fully approved for that purpose by the state's regulatory bodies. Now, obviously in the United States, that's the FDA. And there one turns to prohibitions against medical experimentation, firmly established in both international law and internationally recognized standards for medical ethics. The second factor that I think we can distinguish between technologies on um, and, and affects the regulation of technology or at least the desired regulatory framework for technology is the stage of development of that technology. So different technologies that are of interest to the military are at different stages of development. And while for those technologies that are further advanced, we can identify and regulate the military aspects of its application at a more granular level, for example, um, for example, perhaps some cyber operations. Um, for those technologies that are less well developed, we don't want to have a chilling effect on civilian research while we seek to regulate military application. I mentioned earlier that artificial intelligence research is primarily conducted in the commercial sector, so too with autonomy. To take a different example, however, brain machine interfaces represent a huge opportunity for civilian medical applications. 
for those with life-changing injuries or illnesses, despite also being of interest to the armed forces, for example, for faster operation of weapon systems or operation of multiple weapon systems. One has to tread carefully so as not to stand in the way of incredible scientific breakthroughs that will advance humanity for the better, while also fixing the technical limits at which the necessities of war ought to yield to the requirements of humanity, to quote the St. Petersburg Declaration. Then finally, we have more perhaps meta-level questions to discuss. Bill mentioned these earlier. So for example, when we discuss autonomy and the use of algorithms in selecting and engaging targets on the battlefield, there may be larger questions to discuss. And as Bill pointed out, these are not necessarily questions based in law. One can, of course, frame them in terms of a right to human dignity. But in reality, in my opinion, it comes down to a broader question. Do we want to see decision-making power over life or death over fellow human beings to a computer algorithm and a weapon whose primary purpose is to kill? Because don't forget that we have already done that by degrees in relation to robotic surgery and self-driving cars. So what conclusions can we draw from all of this? Well, one thing is clear. International humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, has proved remarkably adaptive to regulating new technologies. Formulated as it is on general principles with its core expressed in relatively technologically neutral language, it's no surprise that the International Court of Justice had no difficulty in holding that it applied equally to those weapons of the past, of the present, and of the future. So even where we don't have specific weapons conventions, such as those that Bill discussed, we're left with a core of customary international law that emphasizes that the right of combatants to choose their means and methods of warfare is not unlimited. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Heather. And thank you all the panelists for um, an incredible sort of dive into this topic. And as I'd mentioned, incredible, both incredible breadth and incredible depth. Um, I'd like to mention to, uh, to everyone in the audience that if you have questions, uh, to please send them in via the chat and we will uh, answer them uh, to the greatest extent that we can in the time that we have left. Um, so you should feel free to go ahead and send them in via the chat as we begin sort of a sort of discussion for, uh, for the remainder of, of the panel time. Um, so over the course of the three panelists covered a wide variety of different types of, of technologies and potential weapon systems, um, a variety of issues having to do with information and misinformation that, that the public has. Some of that we'll talk about in a, in a moment, perhaps. Um, but one thing that I would note as, as a theme that I think has come out is picking up with what Bill had said at the beginning, that there are different types of technologies that might require different types of regulatory responses from domestic to um, aspects of diplomacy, with a theme that, that Heather uh, spoke about a great deal as well in, in her discussion. One thing that seemed to not be one of the main uh, sources that, that people were describing was there didn't seem to be much of a discussion of a need potentially for new treaties. And a lot of it was having to do with interpretation of it, the existing law that we have and that that might be enough. Um, but there wasn't as much discussion from the new trees. And in part, um, I mentioned this because we seem to be in a time right now when it's not a time in which new treaties are being made, but rather treaties are, are being left um, or you know, are that, that states are leaving various treaty systems. Um, the US in, in, in particular is an example. Um, so I wanted to sort of start that just as sort of as a question, which is, are we at a point right now in terms of discussions having to do with these new technologies and which is an issue of interpretation of existing rules and aspects of diplomacy, um, but not one in which we're really talking about new treaty regimes uh, being enacted? Um, or, is that, or is that a fair interpretation of whatever? So um, I'd open this up for anyone in the panel. I'd, I'd, I'd start perhaps with you, Bill, and, and Heather and Laura, um, anyone who, who, who wants to sort of weigh in on this. I, th I think in many ways, uh, Chris, you're, you're right there is um, a, a perceptible and increasing, in my view, reluctance among states to commit themselves to new treaty provision. 
Having said that, ironically, much of the treaty provision that there has been in recent years has been in the weapons area. Um, on the other hand, there are yawning gaps in legal provision in IHL um, that states seem relatively reluctant to address. And then there are the concerns that fundamental differences of perspective between states make the accomplishment of treaty provision that much less likely. And in those sorts of areas, I wonder whether perhaps one ought to be looking towards regional understandings rather than uh, global treaties, if global treaties are but a distant prospect. Um, I, I, I also think that we need increasingly to accept that one size does not fit all. And as you have said, Chris, that's a theme that underpins uh, both my comments and, and indeed the comments of, I think, all three panelists. Um, in the sense that um, non-treaty arrangements, um, which can have the effect of being the basis in due course of norms, emerging norms, um, are probably to be preferred to um, no development at all uh, where treaty provision uh, can't be achieved and the global community thinks, well, if we can't have a treaty, we won't have anything. Um, I think emerging best practice guidance was the phrase I used in my own comments, is something which uh, can be very useful. Uh, the problem I think we're having, and this you tend to see in the uh, texts coming out of the uh, GGE process on information and communication technologies, certainly the texts that we have seen in the past uh, have been very generalized and very, very voluntary. And um, one would rather like to see a greater degree of specificity simply because that's what operators need if they're going to have um, a framework against which they can perform um, in what, it, what, what stands some chance as being, of being regarded as globally accept, uh, a globally acceptable basis. Heather or Laura, would you like to? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I would agree with, with what Bill said. I think we are living in a time where it is, it is unlikely to get agreement. Um, there isn't an appetite for, for global treaty making um, for even those that have been put through haven't had, um, haven't had a massive pickup from those sort of specially affected states um, that, one, that one would like. And we're also seeing an international forum, whether it's the GGE or whether it's the CCW process that Bill was also talking about with autonomous weapons, a complete misfit between definitions of what people are talking about. So in terms of the GGE on cyber, we have, um, we have as, as Bill pointed out, this idea of information operations and this idea of cyber warfare. And, and the two are moving at, at completely different different paces and incorporating different aspects of, of using the digital realm. Um, and, and one being much broader than the other and Western states not wanting to sign up to that. And then other then then sort of the Russia, China um, block not wanting to to go down the path of, of sort of saying IHL is applicable in, in, in its specificity. Although as I note they did agree to to principles. Um, but um, so we're seeing that, and, and in the CCW, we're seeing even between allies, a complete disconnect between what a definition of an autonomous weapon system is um, and, and you know, whether or not they're going to sign up to it will depend on, on that definition. So I think we're kind of living, uh, the idea of going with what we've got, A, as I say, the law is drafted in such a manner that it can cover new technologies and has been quite adept at doing that. Um, but also, I think that's sort of our, our best option at this stage to say, well, you know, we have, we have these rules and they have lasted um, pretty well, seen change, changes of technology. So that's what we've got. And until someone can actually agree on moving forward on a, on a particular um, 
you know, particular piece of technology and come up with a new protocol to the CCW or, or some other method, then this is where we need to be. And, and as lawyers, then that's, that's our chance to sort of say, okay, this is how we think it should work before we end up in a situation where the technology is used and you get a knee-jerk reaction to it. Um, that's certainly where I've spent my research life. Um, trying to tr trying to fill that gap of of um, thinking through what the possibilities are using that healthy dose of scientifically based imagination um, to but before we get you know to to a point where there is no guidance and suddenly suddenly something happens. Thank you. Um, or did you want to weigh on this point or? Uh, I, I had a, just a quick thing to say. I, I think I did spend that time on space technology because I was trying to make the case that um, the main arguments against treaties are mainly political, not technical. Uh, it's not a question of definitions. It's not a question of verifiability. It's a question of political will and how much intrusive verification you might accept in order to take those. So it's, that's, it's really a question of strategy. And I think, um, you know, my professional concern has been the action reaction cycle that leads to arms arms races when you decline to regulate something that really ought to be regulated. Um, in terms of hypersonic missiles, I think um, I was trying, I'd like, I'd like to advance a case that it's less the technology than the strategic function. So in terms of treaties or arms control, those would really rather be, rather than regulating the technology or the materials, it would really be wrapped up into what are the strategic function and how does that play against the others who might be fielding those. So that's again, I think a question of political will and not the ability to use existing definitions or technologies or law to, to try to shape those strategic questions. Thank you. Um, I'll uh, bring in a question from, uh, from one of our audience members, Peter Margulies. Um, asks, uh, focusing on autonomous weapons, how important is explainability for autonomous weapons? And by that, I, um, I assume that it's the question of, of being able to explain the decision that the autonomous weapon has made in terms of understanding how it got to, uh, got to the decision that it makes. Um, so uh, would anyone like to, to address that question? Sure, yeah, I'll address um, it. So uh, Heather and, and Bill, yep. Um, so thanks for the question. It's a it's a really good question. In terms of um, in terms of its importance, where it really comes in is to the question of accountability, um, and specifically on the question of individual accountability when something goes wrong. Um, so if a state decides to field an autonomous weapon under the law of state responsibility, the state is responsible, regardless of, of whether the machine did it, whether the person who, who activated the machine is responsible. Um, the law of state responsibility doesn't care about fault. Um, but when it comes to individual responsibility, that's where, where explainable AI um, becomes an issue. Um, and, and it, for that, it is very important. Why did it, why did a particular algorithm decide on a particular um, on a particular thing? You can still come back to um, to the commander in some in some senses, but if it's not something that can be predicted, then you've got a lot harder case to make for for individual responsibility for the actions of of an autonomous system. I would agree with everything that Heather has said, and I would add this, that it works, uh, that, that Heather's point works in both directions. Uh, it works in um, considering how do you explain what the particular system did on a particular occasion, viewing that act in retrospect, so to speak. But equally, it works in terms of the acceptability of the system to a commander, because a commander who is told, uh, well, it can do all sorts of things, but we won't be able to explain to you how, and we certainly won't explain to you the reasoning, and um, is immediately that commander is gonna turn around and say, well, maybe you, you can't just not explain the how, but maybe you can't explain the what it's actually going to do. And if you can't explain what it's, not, uh, what it's going to do, then I, I don't find that acceptable as a commander. Um, so I think explainability is a big issue. On the other hand, when we're talking about autonomy, 
I think uh, a large no a dose of realism is going to be called for. And in my view, the autonomy technology is going to be introduced not just in the uh, weapon context, but also in the context of everyday life, so to speak, increasingly. And I think as autonomous decisions become part of the fabric of our everyday lives, we are necessarily going to view those decisions being taken in the military context through a different prism. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that it will in all respects become more acceptable socially to have autonomous decision-making in connection with weapons. I just think that people will view it differently if a number of the um, uh, processes that run their everyday lives, whether it's how their office block uh, heating system works, how the air conditioning system works, um, how the computer systems on which they rely for their work operate, um, how the power distribution system is operated, how the sewerage and water supply systems and so on and so forth operate, the traffic lights, whatever. The minute that that becomes more widespread, I do think that people will will perhaps not be as inclined to see autonomy as a horror, particularly if it works, um, but rather will be more open to viewing the advantages as well as the disadvantages in the light of the greater speed of threat that I was alluding to in my comments earlier on. Well, thank you. Well, with that, we are actually at the end of time already for our panel. Um, so uh, thank you, all of you, for joining us. I'd like to thank Bill Boothby, Laura Grigo, Heather Harrison Dennis for, um, for their presentations. I'd like to thank everybody in the audience who's joined us for our discussion today and the organizers of International Law Weekend for, uh, for having this panel. Um, so uh, once again, thank you all. For, for participating. Uh, we hope to see you all again, if not virtually, then, then in real life, ideally. And, um, and we will uh, look forward to further conferences such as this. Take care.